Um, I'm going to start with the first thing that I deleted from my essay, which was, I thought that I would come here and like everyone will talk about the death of criticism. And I was like, I'm going to start by saying that criticism is alive. And then I figured maybe all of this conversation about the death of criticism is also related to online publishing somehow and to the proliferation of new voices online. And I wanted to see what you guys think about that and like what the connection between that conversation and the rise of online publishing is. True. <laughs> 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 The, I mean, it, you know, se several years ago when there was this whole brouhaha about, uh, um, you know, his criticism in crisis and, and all of that, I, th I thought it was really beside the point. Criticism was never in crisis. Publishing was in crisis, and they're not the same thing. And because the platforms were, were changing and fluid and unknown and, and all of that, things I think sort of got um, misplaced. And what one of the primary differences between, for me at any rate, between digital and print is that in digital there's much more um, opportunity for the kind of chit chat, um, off the top of the head, uh, conversation. As someone said, I, th I think I think it was Isaac, but um, you know, it's like being at a garden party. Um, where people are talking, and usually you only hear that face to face, or if you're eavesdropping at the people in the, you know, in the in the next group. But now it's online. Now it's in print. Now everybody, now billions of people can can see it. So the whole th that whole layer of um, of conversation has gone public. It used to be private. Now it's gone public, for for good and for ill. I think it's created a lot of confusion about um, about criticism. Um, Yeah, I would agree. Uh, one of the things that I'm most excited about, to see, one of the positives that I think is coming out of it, um, th that I meant to, to get to, but I didn't, uh, but is the rise of uh, diverse voices. Um, and I think that that's so important, uh, not just that we have art being made by diverse artists, which I think, of course, is incredibly important, um, but I think we're starting to almost, it's almost trickling up. Like, I think we're seeing more and more artists of color uh, creating work um, and then t talking about that work but we're now also getting to see uh, criticism coming from all these different avenues where there didn't exist uh, a place for that and I think online has been really really great for this kind of rise in the not just the diversity of the art or the diversity of the artists but the diversity uh, of the people that get to have the conversations around the art that we talk about which I think is just so incredibly important uh, to, to, to all these conversations. Like anything, anything gets improved through diversity, through having more and more voices. Um, and I just think that, that that's one of the things that makes me so excited uh, to be part of this time, I guess, is the ability to have these diverse conversations. It's one of the things I'm really proud of BuzzFeed, actually. They really do uh, reach out and try to work with so many different types of people from so many different types of backgrounds to make sure that there's this inclusive uh, group because for a long time, I mean, let's be honest, I'm, look at this panel right here. Um, like, diversity is something that always needs, there needs to be more. Like, we've got one woman. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't want to assume people's backgrounds, but I'm a white boy from Boston. <laughs> um, and so I just, I feel like to have the more diversity, the better. And I think that that's something that we've seen grow with this on, both online publishing uh, art that's being made and also the online conversation around art. Yeah, there are much more, there are many more, like when Pitchfork started, there was, um, there were not a lot of other music publications out there, and as we've grown, you know, it's, it, there have been, all of a sudden, there are now all these music publications, music blogs, there's so many different opinions coming out about all these different, you know, about all these different records. I mean, there are, there's just a, a tremendous number of voices, and Pitchfork staff has grown as well, so we have now, like, you know, uh, somewhere in the range of like 120 contributors or freelancers, and yeah, it's really it's always really interesting to see you know how people um, how people engage with things differently and how people's backgrounds play into it. Okay, I'm going to move from the death of criticism to that death of the critic, the appendix in the art world. Don't look at me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally like this is my like I like all of you so much. This is my first point of contention. I think criticism is still really important. I never shy away from telling artists, like, I have dinner, there's a bunch of artists at the table, they ask me, what do I do? I respond, I'm an art critic. I think it's really important. I find myself as like, completely equal within the art scene as to, to them, basically. I think my role is to have the exact same conversation at the exact same level of rigor 
as them. And I don't think they'd give that up. Maybe some of them would, especially some that I've written about, but I don't think they would want to give it up. Mm. Um, I think that's a really important thing to discuss, especially as you're saying, like, more and more criticism happening online. It seems crazy to think that, like, that is not just as important as the rest of cultural production. An, an artist once said to me, you know, without me, you wouldn't have a job. You wouldn't have anything to write about. And I said, <laughs> that is not true. If there were no artists, I could write endlessly about why not. Also, I like want to. I just feel like uh, also without you, you know, their art. How does their art get discovered? Um, and I, I do. I, I felt like your talk was just absolutely incredible, and the honesty of it, and what it means to work for a publication, and to try and attract people to your, your readership, and basically. But you have, especially somebody that's been in the game uh, for as long as you have, and has had such an established career. Like you have your own fan base, um, and we were talking a little bit about this earlier. But it's just like this dependability. People know they can turn to you, and that you're going to have an opinion about it. And I feel like what sh what the critic does, and and even if it even if it is scathing, it still is drawing attention to the artist and the artist's work. So without them, you definitely would have some something to talk about. But without <laughs> you, uh, you know, they maybe wouldn't have people talking about their stuff. Yeah. Yes and no. I mean, um, I think. How can I put this? Um, I think artists, um, as I said in my talk, artists, artists are going to do what they're going to do. And if, if I'm not around to you know, direct attention towards them, they're, they're going to find ways to make whatever they need to happen happen. Um, they're really good at that. Um, and you know, it, uh, it's, 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 much more, um, it's much more a back and forth I think, as, as Arit was saying, than me directing people to them. I mean, they're directing me to them. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean yeah. artists are, um, at, at any rate. And working for a newspaper, I also feel a certain obligation to principally write about um, art that a readership can s see. Um, so I'm not, I'm not in the business of discovering people who haven't had, you know, an exhibition or aren't in an exhibition somewhere or so on. Um, so it's, it, it's, a, it's a, little more, a little more of a, um, a balanced situation, I think. Mm -hmm. And also art is growing to be a more and more discursive thing. So, much art, so many artists right now, they're expected to be able to talk about their work. Like yeah. That even puts you on a more equal level. Do you feel that same way about music? I feel like I don't see as many, like, musicians talking about their work analytically or yeah no I think that's true uh, music um, I think it, it's it's sort of um, it's almost automatic like I, I make music as well like I just um, you know for myself I sit down and play and I think that the, that release it's not you know it's 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 not all it's not it's more physical in, in a lot of ways and yeah I think that people um, that artists don't um, I, I don't know I think obviously it depends on the artist there's some obviously very brilliant artists who who, who do think extremely intellectually about it but um, you know I think um, one of the roles too of critics is kind of um, you know dis distinguishing where within the, the canon or where within um, an artist discography you know certain um, Certain releases fall, and you know, and kind of telling the story overall, and and how that's how that's shaped. So yeah, I think it's kind of an interesting thing. Okay, now I warn you in advance. I'm going to move to the positive and negative <laughs> thing. Why don't we start though with the Bambi rule and what you actually learned from that conversation? All right. <laughs> what were you thinking about in the bathtub? Is what we wanted. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. I won't lie, man. That is. You should write. Write your. Write your speeches beforehand. <laughs> I did not expect for that to spill out of my mouth. I will not. I feel like I made eye contact with like one person in here, and like you looked really empathetic, and I was like, "All right, man, I'm gonna tell this whole entire crowd of strangers about the half a day I spent in a bathtub in the dark." Um, I, I, this is a story I actually haven't told. And I, again, like I said, I kind of just walked away from it and tried to disengage. So this, is, I'm talking about it kind of for the first time, um, but. It was an interview that I gave at 6 a.m. Um, if you read the whole entire thing, like we're, you were talking about having a little segment taken out and then blown up. Um, it was kind of a very offhand comment, um, just trying to answer somebody's question. Uh, it, did, it was born in the rumpus. 
I won't lie about that. Uh, the Rumpus, we had a very hard and strict rule. Do not review your friend's books. I think that is a very, we're talking credibility here. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Like That's you definitely, fun, you should basic. not do that. That's very basic. Yeah. Um, but the, the other thing we wanted to do was there are so many other places that are there and stand ready to protect the readership. If somebody who has a giant name and they're coming out with a book and that book is bad, that is somebody's job to point that out, to say that, you know what, this person, this is not their best work, or maybe it's their worst work. And obviously, different people have different feelings about that. But at the Rumpus, our main goal was we're going to kind of stay out of that, not because we don't think it's important, but because there are so many other places that already do it. And so I kind of carried that into it. And literally, it just comes from like growing up, and like Bambi was the first movie I'd ever seen, <laughs> and like it has a place in my heart, and I have these like little McDonald's figurines that I remember getting with my mom. It's like all very uh, precious. Um, <laughs> but like that just popped into my head and I was like, and it's funny too. It's not actually Bambi. It's Thumper. It's Thumper. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Wait, should if, we have this panel about Disney actually? <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's, you know, don't, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. What I meant was that's how I'm going to run my little, my Isn't little area. Throwing responsibility away. Other people will do that. I'm not going to do that. It's also, I mean, it is mm -hmm. remunerating to do that because negative reviews travel really well. Mm -hmm. But it also means that you're escaping something that's kind of hard to do. Something that means that you're going to run into someone in the street and they're going to be like, you, you published that <laughs> thing about me. I don't go out a lot. So <laughs> <I> probably <laughs> that probably wouldn't happen. No, um, no, again, uh, I don't, it's a responsibility that I personally don't feel like I've ever picked up that banner. So I don't actually feel like uh, I'm letting go of it. I think I've been very, that's actually what I was trying to do is I'm trying to be very straightforward about the type of, like I don't, I didn't want to hide it. Like I didn't want, like I wanted to be very straightforward about that's my approach to it. But again, that is just my approach. I'm not trying to be the best critic. I'm again, Boston, Athol, Massachusetts. I hope America's best critic doesn't come from those two places. Like, you know, like, <laughs> I'm not, that's not, that's not what I'm setting out to do. Um, and so that's kind of why I feel okay with it. Um, and, and, and like you're saying, there are, the, the guy that you mentioned, the New York Times writer, the, who wrote that incredible review. Pete Wells. Yeah. He just had another one. Yeah, he's the king of that. Which yeah. was fabulous. Yeah. And yeah. you think I didn't read that? And I was just like, mmm, <laughs> this is delicious. <laughs> like, of course, of course. Yeah. Like, absolutely. I loved it. Um, but just, just like I wouldn't start reviewing food, like what I know is just a love of books. So I do, I do kind of stay in my lane. And again, you're talking to somebody who I promised I would never leave San Francisco, and then I left San Francisco. So like now I'm saying this, and who knows where I'll be in five years. Like you can't, like the, really what I took away from it was never make hard, fast statements. <laughs> um, yeah. But, but I'm, I'm open to discussing it here if you guys want to talk about it. I, ha I have as a general rule of thumb in, in terms of negativity, um, only punch up, never punch down. Um, if an artist is, you know, having their first show in a gallery and it's and I hate it, I don't review it. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter. Yeah. Know. See, I think if, if it's some, if it's a major artist having yet another show that I dislike, <laughs> I'm more than happy to write about it. Yeah, I think it's I think it's actually really essential because in a lot of cases, um, artists can happen overnight. They can, you know, they can come out of, out of nowhere and be suddenly relevant to the conversation. And I think even with um, unestablished artists, you know, it's, it's worth pointing out, you know, it's, these artists can become more relevant. They can start, you know, evolving. You know, there's a lot of amazing artists whose, uh, whose initial records are not really, uh, are, not, are not their best work and maybe are their worst work. And, um, and within the, the greater conversation for us we want to have a very complete you know kind of catalog of that artist's work so if they start off on something and then they kind of evolve and become you know a little bit more uh, become more relevant become more um, significant their art becomes better it becomes you know brighter I think you know having that initial um, having that initial uh, review is really is really essential to you know to to parsing their 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 work as a whole yeah. And I'm going to bring money back into this because apparently that's my role here. But like, we all work in an industry that make a lot of money. It seems really important that like, do you have to keep the market in check. I have written about artists who were younger than me, who had their first solo show ever and wrote really negative reviews about them because they sell, because I know they're selling. And that seems really important to be like, this is selling because it's pretty and it looks digital, but it is not good work. 
point blank. I know that's, that's a matter of like taste and opinion, et cetera, et cetera, and taste is something you should get over, but it seems like a really crucial word. Um, but I also, in my research about this positive and negative thing, which all sparked from Isaac, basically, I found this amazing quote from Susan Sontag that says, <laughs> I don't ultimately care for handing out grades for a work of art, which is what I've avoided the why I avoided the opportunity of writing about things I didn't admire. I'm also interested in the grading. Yeah, thing. yeah. Um, I think ratings are, um, well, when I was, um, before I started doing Pitchfork, I read a ton of music criticism, and I read a lot of um, a lot of books about, um, you know, guidebooks, essentially, you know, um, like, uh, and, and I think that, uh, I think just having an at a glance kind of a, it sets the tone sort of for what the review is about to say. Um, and I think it's also good. Like I'm, I'm sort of a populist type of person and I also li I really like the, um, the ability to kind of like, it, it kind of opens it up to a little bit of a broader audience. Like people, you know, there's a lot of people who just aren't that interested in criticism as well. So having something there and having them that kind of grabs their attention is like, okay, I kind of know what you're saying. I'll read, you know, a bit of it. But like, you know, we also, I think that the ratings are really, um, again, for setting a framework of, of the artist's, you know, discography, they're, they're actually really tricky because, you know, uh, Pitchfork scale is so, like, appears to be so scientific, you know, 7.9 or, you know, these very, <laughs> like, you know, uh, granular kind of ratings. And, um, and, and it's, it's somewhat, that's sort of somewhat of a gut, there's not really a lot of science to it, it's just this is where we kind of feel. And I think that, that our readers kind of know the difference between, you know, a, what the difference is between a, an 8.1 and an 8.8, .8, you know, that there is actually a vast difference. When you're reviewing five records a day, um, you know, and you have a, a catalog of, of thousands upon thousands of reviews, these, these distinctions, you know, make, a little, make, make sense. But, um, but I do think that, yeah, that ratings are, um, they're, they're a form of, a form of populism, but also I think, um, you know, of just placing things in context. You said the word attention a bunch of times in that. Do you think ratings has to do with online attention? Do people expect that more online? I think so, yeah. I think, I mean, everything moves really pretty quickly on the internet. It's easy to be distracted. It's easy to, you know, and I think that having that there, like if we didn't have that to expect, to expect people to read long form, because I think it's actually a nice balance because where our reviews are, are often quite long and I think that's unusual. You know, it allows the writer to go very in depth and give the reader a lot to choose on and really back up, really back up their argument. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think that, uh, but, but attention is, is uh, it is, um, I think the rating does play into that a lot. And I just want to say, like, as a fan, <laughs> it works. Yeah. Um, like, I, uh, you were talking about remembering looking at Pitchfork for the first time. We were talking a little bit about this before, but, like, I was raised on, uh, like, two tapes, like, Les Miserables and Billy Joel. And, like, that's, <laughs> that was my musical education. Yeah. Uh, and I remember discovering Pitchfork, and it was, as somebody who didn't know music background, didn't know music theory, didn't really even know a lot. It, it became such an easy place to discover things for me. And that rating system, because I, that's exactly who I was, was I, I probably wasn't gonna read a bunch of different reviews, but to be able to, oh, here's this band, wow, this is a, they, they, they obviously think very highly of this, like I'm gonna read it, or like, oh, it's really rough, like, but that's, it's what brought me in, yeah. it's what engaged me, because it, like you said, it was this framework that I knew. I was like, I know what a grading system is. <laughs> I can relate to this. Right. Did you introduce a grading system in BuzzFeed? No. Why not? Oh, God. You did that thing. You made me say something hard and fast. <laughs> um, again, because I don't do what Pitchfork does. Uh, we are, I, my role, the way I view my role is I am your, I'd like to think of myself as like your friend who's just like, this is the book you got to check out. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not, there's not going to be like a rating of how much I think this like thing is. I, these, the books that I tend to talk about, the authors I tend to talk about are people that I really think other people should be discovering. So it, a rating system in the context and how I talk about books really wouldn't make sense, but I really appreciate that Pitchfork does it. Would a rating system make sense in arts? Every now and then in the past there's been discussions at the paper, should we go to a you know, multi-star review, five star, four star? And we've always resisted it, I think for good reason. Um, whereas you're suggesting that it can help bring people to it, I think it pushes people away. 
Um, oh, it's only got three stars, I'm not going to read that. Um, and if the writer can't, if the writer can't bring, uh, bring the reader through the, through the piece, then get a new writer. Um, my, my primary goal in writing a review is that once a reader reads the first paragraph, I consider it a success if they get all the way to the end. And if they don't get all the way to the end, then the review is a flop. Whether they go see the show or so on, you know, I'm really happy if it inspires people to go see a show or, or something like that. But mostly I just want them to read the whole thing. And, you know, putting stars at the top would um, affect that, I think, in a negative way. See, I would think that, I mean, I think maybe from um, uh, kind of an intuitive place, that, that seems like it makes sense. But in our case, really, we find a lot, we find that people, at least from the metrics, like, will, will uh, you know, spend an average of three to four minutes on our review pages, which is a lot. I mean, some people are spending, like, seven or eight minutes on the review pages. And, um, and so I think that th that's something that, like, early on, pitch people would say about Pitchfork, oh, I only look at the ratings or whatever. And I'm like, well, that says something about you then. You know, but I think that... Um, that the that the ratings are they are a hook like it's interesting knowing to going into something you know how good or how bad do you think this is and that to me is always is always sort of an engaging starting point it just gives you like a little reference and um and from there you may you may be interested in reading something that you didn't know you were interested in reading you know if i uh, without uh, any kind of rating system or without a best new music or whatever, I think that Pitchfork would not be what it is. I think that um, these types of things kind of allow, are, are a way of kind of just hooking somebody and getting, getting them a little bit more interested. There are five reviews a day. So if I'm su supposed to sit and read five 2,000 word reviews, you know, in a day, that's a, that's a lot of expectation to place on readers because we want, we really want to be comprehensive. We really want to be thorough. Um, and I think that just giving people a place to start, it's like, oh, wow, this Mumford & Sons record is a two or is a 1.9. What does that mean? You know, I think getting into that is, uh, like, I think that's, that's a, f it's a fun place to start, you know? Oh, I really have to read what they said about this. <laughs> Um, I wonder too, because having a rating system means that you have this like recognizable structure that I know from food criticism, which I clearly read all the time. Does that help people assert their authority? This seems really important online. You work with young critics, you work with young critics. How do people assert authority online over Yelp if Yelp is considered something that is not as valuable? Um, I, I think through... Um, how do they assert authority? I think really just through like, you know, through the strength of their opinions, you know, it's, it's like any other critic I, in, in a lot of ways. I think that people who are experienced critics or experienced Yelp reviewers, in some cases you can kind of tell. Um, but yeah, I think just the, uh, they're writing the review, just the practice of reviewing is asserting authority. Could you assert authority if you're only writing positive reviews? How do you develop a long lasting voice if you're only doing yeah. positive? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. That, I think that would be really, really difficult. Um, you know, I think that a sort asserting authority, it really at that point, it just comes down to the taste of coverage, right? As to like, what is, is somebody writing about and what is kind of new and what's coming to the surface and, and I'm listening for myself and do I like it? It's a very different kind of practice. Um, so I find that to be, it's one way of, of doing it, but I think that asserting authority, I think the negatives really, negativity lends weight to the positivity. You know, it, without, without one, there's just, a, there's not this balance, there's varying degrees or varying shades of positive. Um, and <coughs> yeah, I think that um, you need to, uh, that the negative really, um, I think that when, uh, like for example, Pitchfork is very, um, we kind of have a reputation as being tough critics or difficult to please. And I think because of that, it does lend more weight to when we think something is really exceptional. Um, I think it creates a little bit more interest. And not to like keep hitting a dead horse, I will say that that works perfectly for him. Um, <laughs> for, to answer your question though, for me it's dependability. It's uh, do the recommendations that I make please my readership. Um, so our newsletter that we have, it goes out twice a week, and once a week we have a small review, just a paragraph long. It's just our, it's the new book to recommend that we recommend that people read that week. Uh, and obviously not everyone reads each book each week. It all depends on how much time you have, et cetera, et cetera. But that newsletter has over 150,000 subscribers. Um, that means that those people find our recommendations 
uh, that they like them enough to keep getting their, e I mean, email is time. Um, and so for me, it's about being a dependable person. I'm not walking around giving gold stars to everything. I really take a long time and I read a lot of books and I get pitched a lot of essays that I do not publish that I tend not to talk about. So for me, it's about dependability uh, and, and really the sh having a strength of, of having good taste. Um, and again, Chris, this is something I feel like you have um, on, in spades in both, the negative and the positive. People, uh, you have a fan base that depends on you and really enjoys, sometimes probably disagree with you. Um, but definitely enjoys hearing your thoughts. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> often disagree. Yeah, I was thinking, what's the opposite of a fan base? A loathing base? Because <laughs> I, I have one of those, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, in, in, in terms of credi credibility, I think, you know, may, maybe just because I work for legacy media, um, there, there is a, a kind of built-in institutional weight that comes along with, uh, with that, for good and for ill. I mean, when I, when I started writing in the 1980s, probably, journalistically speaking, the most powerful um, journalistic critic, art critic in America was Hilton Kramer at the New York Times. And since I didn't know anything about journalism, um, I read him religiously, even though I find him to be a loathsome, reprehensible, <laughs> hideous human being. Um, <coughs> he's dead now, so... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> but I also, at the same time, regard him as absolutely brilliant as a journalist. He knew how to push those buttons that a newspaper has in a way that very few other journalistic critics knew how to do. He was really, really good at it, which is part of the reason that he, he developed the, um, you know, whatever clout he had. So I, I, would, um, I would read him for that purpose, to, to, learn how to, to learn how to use journalism in, um, in certain ways. And he often had all the right reasons for coming to the wrong conclusion, um, so I would take the reasons, <laughs> <laughs> rewrite them. Um, so the, the, the credibility thing can, speaking of negativity, can, uh, can be useful in, in that way too. I just, I want to say one thing, just jump back a little bit, Go because ahead. I don't want it to just float out there. You also said that a lot of this conversation sparked from those comments that I made. Um, and I just want to make sure that folks see things in like a broader sense. The reason that's, is this is not, it's not a new conversation. Like I want to make that very clear. Like that blew up around that time about a year and a half ago. Um, but before that, when Believer Magazine came out, it blew up. Um, it's a conversation that, like, this positive negative thing is a conversation that's always kind of been a part of criticism. And talking about people like loving or loathing and fights between critics, um, the Renat, Renata Adler, uh, and uh, yeah, who did she go after? I, the name's uh, it's slipping me. Do you remember? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Say it louder. Yeah. One more time with Gusto. Pauline Kell. Pauline Kell. There it is. <laughs> um, like that, again, like it, it is fascinating and it gives people things to talk about. Um, but these are, again, this is all kind of the conversations we've had about criticism for decades, if not longer. Yeah, I'm going to take that back and say that just like my research has come out of the links. Like, I know this conversation has been going on forever. I have been interested in it forever, too. <laughs> Um, but I'm going to move from the positive negative thing to a really great question that came from the audience. I feel like I'm like a radio show host huh. or something. <laughs> um, this is from Luke Finces, <laughs> who's asking if critics have a role in guiding artists or the scene or the industry somehow. And that seems really important in this context. What do you think? I know you think you have a role. I can see that in your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, yeah, I think we do have a role. I mean, I think that it is... Um, uh, I think we have a role really for our readers. All different critics have different perspectives, have different vantage points, different tastes, and I think they, you know, they resonate with their, with their audiences in different ways. And a lot of different publications, um, even covering the same type of art or same medium, um, you know, have different, um, have kind of a different perspective that, um, that, that they've built a trust with their readership that they turn to. So, uh, I mean, it's, it's not really in shaping, like, the industry. It's really in shaping our own kind of perspective on music. Do you ever give feedback to musicians? Um, yeah. Like one-on-one? -on -one? Yeah, well, I mean... I do to an extent um, when uh, when they're when they when when prompted I would say you know I don't usually just go up and say you know what that show is really good but you need you know have you have you considered like an in-ear monitor or something you know <laughs> it's like it's not like um, I, I don't usually do 
that kind of thing. Like for the most part, um, I don't know. I, I, I generally am more interested in artists' um, kind of perspective. I, I'll usually ask them questions about like their art and how they make it. Um, you know, I, I'm really interested in gear, for example, and I'm always interested in how they, you know, and, and the actual process of, of, the, of, of that. So I'll, I'll ask them a lot of those types of questions. But, you know, when, when, I'm, when I'm asked about it, you know, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be pretty candid, but, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a different, um, discussion when it's one-on-one, -on -one, you know, I'm not trying to be cruel, you know, um, so it's, uh, yeah, it, it varies a little bit. What about your role? Do you? Um, yeah, be, I, I mean, I think it's, uh, things affect other things. I think it's like physics or something some scientists would understand, but I, you know, every, everything you do kind of affects, and so uh, for me, it's really about like what we share which again gets into the philosophy. I'm just talking about BuzzFeed books here, but BuzzFeed kind of as a whole is this like, what do you go out, uh, what, what is something that's so good uh, that you wanna share it? Uh, this kind of gets into the idea of like clickbait, right? Uh, there was a time in the mid 2000s, I worked for another website that trafficked very heavily in this, is it was how to get a click. Um, and that's not the philosophy behind where I work now. It's because if you get a click and then the person doesn't like what they see, they're not gonna take the next step to share. And like, that's the real important thing. So for me, the, what we all share, what we all talk about, there's, of course it's going to influence what art gets created um, and what people are interested in things uh, because we're not, none of us live in, in, in a bubble. Um, and, that's, I, and I think that's a very good thing. So he, art, much like music to be honest, is something that like, I really enjoy now, but I'm not very well versed in it. So I just went to the Brooklyn Art Museum recently um, and I had a very big fear moment. It ties into music as well. I didn't want to be the person at the show that just holds up the camera and like periscopes the whole, the whole like, right? Those people are really annoying, right? Yeah. You go to a show, yeah. somebody's got a selfie stick, it's up for like two <laughs> hours and they're like, like that's really annoying. But at the same time, when I saw art that I really liked at the Brooklyn Art Museum, you know, I asked the security and they're like, no, please actually take photo. We really encourage that because it allowed, um, you know, maybe somebody that doesn't get to go to the Brooklyn Art Museum to, to enjoy that and to take time with that. And so, and I do feel like that kind of movement, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a type of fandom, mm -hmm. to be honest. But like, I think that does, there's no way that that doesn't influence it. It's all part of the conversation. Yeah, there's also a feedback loop that's already built in to being an author. You have a relationship with your editor, which you've mm -hmm. discussed. Artists don't get that after art school. Do you do studio visits, for example, as like informal feedback? Do you think consider that part of your role as a critic? Do I consider what? Part? Doing studio visits? Oh, do studio visits. I, I don't often do studio visits anymore, um, but it's mostly just a practical consideration, like who has time. Um, I love being in artist studios. You find out all kinds of things. Um, but I typically, I will typically do that at my request rather than their request, just because I don't know how else to, um, to prioritize things. Um, and in, in a, I don't mean to completely change the, the topic, and maybe, maybe I'm not, but I was thinking about it in, in terms of um, criticism, negativity, and so on. What, one of the virtues, I think, of newspapers is my column is not supported by advertising. Um, there is some you know, art-related advertising in a newspaper, but it's like the, the, only, the only newspaper where it's significant is the New York Times. Um, so I find a huge amount of freedom in, in that fact. Um, and I get a lot of editorial support because I don't think it, um, uh, I mean they recognize it, it doesn't impact that way. And it's the reason that I stopped writing for trade magazines um, in 1996. Um, the Museum of Modern Art was doing a Jasper Johns retrospective and at that time Art Forum would commission, when they commissioned a cover story, they would, they would commission two, so there would be two different voices because, God forbid, our forum should have a point of view <laughs> um, because it had Snap. advertisers to serve. Um, so they asked Rosalind Krauss and me to write pieces about John's, and I was really excited to do it because his work had been extremely important to me personally just in the way I think about art and the way I developed thinking about art. But his work from the late 80s and early 90s, I didn't like at all. And I never really had a chance to think through why. Uh, so I took the gig, the opening, I can quote the opening line of the review, which is, um, I don't 
like not liking Jasper John's recent work. Um, because what I wanted to do in the piece was parse out why. And they went ballistic at art form. You can't say that. <laughs> <laughs> Jasper Jim, <Jim's> like, what? <laughs> um, and we had a real knockdown drag out. And event they, they basically sent back a rewritten review, which started elsewhere in the review about how great he was and, and all of this. <laughs> and I sent it back. Then, no, 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 no. And it was, just, you know, by that point, I had been used to newspaper writing where I could basically, you know, take a uh, position, which I think is an important thing to do. And we eventually came to terms um, and w were, I think, both satisfied with, w with the piece that, that ran. Um, but I decided at that point, I'm not going to do that anymore. So but you got to keep that lead, yeah? I haven't. I, yeah. No, no, well, but you got to keep that line. It yeah. opened with oh, that yeah, line. It opens with that. I have never had that problem with really? print publications. Wow. Um, that seems like a really important thing to discuss actually, mm -hmm. and the ethics of it, too. Mm -hmm. What does that mean to write? But I also wonder about whether or not multiplicity of voices cancels that out. So you say art form, like, God forbid art form would have a statement or an opinion. <laughs> um, does covering everything releases you from that? You talk a lot about like comprehensiveness. Yeah. Um, I talk a lot about selectiveness, because as far as I'm concerned, what I'm covering, like, the fact that I covered it, that it appeared in the pages of whatever magazine, already means more than anything I wrote. And I see that, too. I see galleries. Or This week, a museum shared a really negative review that I wrote all over Facebook and Twitter. They're like, oh, Reed Gat has some really interesting ideas about this show. And I'm like, my interesting ideas was that the show is terrible. They don't care. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think... Um, well, actually, what you were talking about, I think that um, I, I've seen that happen. I know writers talk about it um, and, um, and, and have talked about it happening to them at other publications. Um, in fact, we had um, a, a, a handful of writers come to work for us because at a former publication they found that their reviews, they were being stifled by, by, the, um, by the publishers saying, you know, you can't um, run a negative review of this certain thing, or we need to be a little bit more positive or diplomatic because we have every, you know, and they have, they find, I, I'm sure the conversation wasn't that direct. I'm sure it was a little bit more couch. But, you know, the, the fact of the matter is that many publications, ad dollars, do, um, you know, do actually have an impact on what is, um, on what is and can be said. Um, for us, um, the, uh, the, the writers, the editors, uh, the editors in chief, um, don't are, are not privy at all to what ads are going to run on the site, so they can't know. It's not, uh, you know, it's something we want them to be oblivious of, and um, and it's also, um, you know, something that um, is uh, that that really you just can't have these two these two opposing forces, you know. Um, uh, you know, it, it, we've had many instances where um, where a negative review ran on the site, and it was plastered around the ads for the album is plastered around this review, <laughs> and it's such a strange, such a strange, you know, um, feeling or a strange look. But it's but it, it's really necessary, and I always kind of revel in that and kind of take pride in it because it's it sh it shows it's right out there in front of everybody. Look, you can see for yourself these things do not do not coincide. And, um, and I think that's really crucial. And, and it's also interesting that I, like, I kind of in increasingly um, pitchforks, um, some of the ads are, are less supported by, um, by labels and things like that now as well. But um, that's not necessarily as by design, but it is, um, but it is it's sort of the reality of things. I actually really believe in advertising that doesn't come from your own industry. Like, uh -huh. I think if all maga art magazines were supported by fashion labels, for example, it would release me so much. You could write anything you want. I can write everything I want, but when I was an editor, I was definitely like told certain things should not be written or like, it just don't cover it if that's yeah. what you're going to write. Right. That's an advertiser. That's the biggest gallery in the city. Yeah. Um, no, you have to be willing to risk those relationships um, because, you know, also people change at these companies all the time. Like an old person will leave, a new person will come in. And, you know, these relationships, they can be repaired. It's, uh, what, what's really important is that, you know, you, we, we stand for our opinion and that our opinion is, is not affected by that. It's, uh, I think it's just, it's like 101, you know, in journalism. And, and, and like you said, it's something that, that uh, you hear all the time. People are, you know, uh, publishers always want 
um, you know, you want, you're, they, they're, they're playing a very difficult, you know, game of balancing both sides of, of this thing, trying to make everybody happy, but you just can't. You just can't make everybody happy. And that it gets to the credibility. Like yeah. The, fa the fact that journalism, criticism, whatever, right, what are we all grasping at? Life in general is just like grasping at truth. And like, if you start ignoring that, oh. Um, Sorry. Like you're, you're gonna lose your audience. <laughs> like yeah. So many questions you from the so audience. You have so many Speaking yeah. of like Long losing time your first audience. First time caller. <laughs> first time caller. Yeah. <laughs> um, wait, I want to like stay on the money thing, obviously, um, and talk about payments for writers yes. too, because that seems like a part of an ethics of a website. You didn't pay writers for a long time. At I the rumpus, at let us be clear. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Um, I don't believe in writing for exposure. I think it's really important as a woman that I say that, actually, mm -hmm. yeah. because people would assume that I'll be supported other how, somehow, in some mystery way. Yes. <laughs> um, well, yeah. Um, I agree. I, so to be honest, I, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, it is actually part of the reason why I felt I wanted to move on past the rumpus. I was really proud of my time there. I was really proud of the work that was done there. And I still actually do believe that it's helped a lot of people's careers. And a lot of time I have to have faith in the writer that they are an adult enough to make that call. If they want to work for free, that really is on them. I like working for the rumpus like that. It came out of my first year, I can say this, I made $12,000 in San Francisco. I hear that goes a long way in San Francisco. Yeah, <laughs> it does not. Um, so I was working, you know, it was like working for, for nothing, but it's because I really believed in it. So I do, I don't, I don't want to say that those publications, like if, if you're trying to make something happen, whether it's build a community or cover a certain thing that you think there needs to be coverage out there, and there's just no money there and everybody, it's a labor of love, I think that's important and that that place exists and that's wonderful. Um, I will say that one of my favorite things about being at BuzzFeed Books is that I get to pay my writers. Um, because I also do think, especially in this day and age, it becomes more and more important. Um, in the mid-2000s, there was the shakeup. What are we gonna do? Build the airplane, figure it out when we're in the sky. Uh, great, what have we done? Beautiful editorial. Anybody know anything about business? Shit. Uh, <laughs> and, that, and, that's, and that's really uh, a problem. But what we have now, and what I think you see more and more, whether it's a place that's been around for 20 years or newer websites, I think a lot more focus is being paid to how, not, no pun intended, uh, to paying writers and how you can not only keep the company afloat, but also feel like you are treating your writers, your critics, uh, whoever's creating the content for you um, as human beings. And so I, th I think especially if there's any way to make it work, and in this day and age, there's so many tools to make it work. If you're working on a wonderful little website and you have no money, uh, start a Kickstarter. Like do, there's, there's a way, if you have built up the fan base, there's different ways to, to monetize so that you can even, even just a little bit pay the folks. And then it's their call whether they want to write for X amount of money, but I think it, it, it's a very important part. I also wonder about that connection between a salary and the kind of writing that you get to do. I remember, I'm blanking on his name right now, the other art critic for the LA Times. Um, I, don't, I can't remember Current, his name. recent. Current, yeah, like f 40 years old. It doesn't matter who it is. <laughs> uh, he was amazing at some panel. Someone asked him what the value of criticism was, and his response was, a dollar a word. <laughs> Point blank. Um, it was David Pagel. Yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, having a position being paid yeah. allows you to write very particular things. It yeah. liberates you in a certain way. What do you think is going to happen now that, like, clearly I'm not going to get your job one day. Never going to happen. There aren't any art critics anymore. Well, that's good because I've got a mortgage, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, well, one of the other one of the other good things about uh, legacy media is that they will um, they will support me to do things like that. They will underwrite my being at something like this. Um, I'm doing this for free. I'm not being paid to be here by the Walker because it's not a good idea for the chief art critic at the Los Angeles Times to be cashing a check uh, issued by a major art museum <laughs> that is part of you know potentially part of, of coverage. And so the newspaper, the newspaper allows me to be able to, um, to do something like that. Um, in terms of, of monetizing criticism, that's, that's beyond my pay grade. That's the business side, and I don't know anything about how that works. I don't know how they do it. <laughs> it's a mystery to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna stick with that. There's also a really good question from the audience about 
um, ethics. This is from Anna Cyril Jones, who's asking what are the boundaries between the critic, the journalist, and the publicist. I also think it's really interesting that superscript is about art journalism and criticism, whereas I differentiate myself from journalism because that is what happens online in the art world. It's just journalism. What are these boundaries? How important are they? Um, b boundaries but between journalism, criticism, and the publicist, which is a whole different question of ethics, actually, but like coverage and criticism. What is the difference? Well, j I mean, you know, there's, I consider myself a journalistic critic, and then there's straight journalism too, straight reporting too. And there are, there are places where, where they cross, and there are places where it's clearly separate. Um, my byline says critic, so the reader is clued in that what you're about to read is an opinion. And if that's not on the, on the byline, what you're about to read is theoretically fact. <laughs> may or may not be, <laughs> um, depending on, on the situation. Um, but I, th I think that, I think that there, there is um, there's generally, generally a separation between the two that is fairly clear in the way newspapers are laid out. Yeah, I think this is muddled a little bit online. Though that like separation that I consider really important, yeah. um, I think people look at an art website and they're like, "This is criticism. This is critical analysis." Yeah. And I think it's reporting. Do, do, do you yeah. do you consider yourself journalists as well as critics? No. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm outnumbered. <laughs> I'm, I don't have the memory. I don't have the facts. Um, like, and that's what I respect about journalism. That's that's what makes it. Uh, that's what makes it what it is, and that's that. Like I feel like the the boundaries are actually just in the definitions of the words, you know. Um, and then as far as to bring publicity into it, like that's totally different. That is, somebody gets paid to promote something. That's what publicity is. Um, and from the place that either published it or the art institute that that is throwing the the show. To, you know, at at the risk of getting too philosophical here, um, the First Amendment, <laughs> to the Constitution. <laughs> Um, I think has really, ch our, our understanding of what the press is has really been negatively impacted in the last 50 or 60 years when w we generally seem to think that freedom of the press means that the press will not be um, constrained by government, that that's what the Constitution, uh, th that's what the First Amendment is for. Um, and it's true, but it's also only half the equation. The reason it, th that, the, the, um, that the free press is in the, in the First Amendment is an assertion that citizens have a right to information in order to make the democracy work. Um, and that's the half of the, the equation that has disappeared in the last 50 years. The idea that citizenry has a right to information is gone. Nobody thinks about that at all. So the whole idea of monetizing um, journalism uh, becomes a, a bigger issue than it really ought to be. Initially, when, you know, after the Constitution was written and, and, the, and the country was being founded, the government subsidized the journalism because it was important. Uh, franking privileges, you paid less to, you know, to send newspapers through the mail than um, you know, than business contracts, <laughs> you know, things like that, because it was important to do. And whether or not there is a way in which to make that, um, that half of the equation more prominent at a time when we're all drowning in seas of billionaires' money, um, you know, I think it's, uh, it's arguable that that's not going to happen anytime soon, which is really too bad. Should we take questions from the audience? Anyone? Um, okay, why don't we start with you, and then we'll go to you, okay? Um, pink, yeah. Um, so wait, wait, wait. Okay. Internet. Think about the internet. <laughs> 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 Hi, um, I'm Patricia Maloney from Art Practical and Daily Serving, and I need to go back, Isaac, to you, the end of your presentation and s just sort of call you to task on imploring people to start their own initiatives, because I think this is a room full of people who have either started their own initiatives or are like deeply invested in contributing to independent publications. So I just wanted to put that out there for this group. And then as someone who is 
really invested in an independent publication that is also invested in locality. I wanted to go back to that idea of the positive and negative, I think, um, is much more nuanced um, when you think about the ways in which so much of what we do is trying to represent um, the values of our cultural communities. And I think that's a self-canceling thing immediately. It means that because you're committed to a scene, you're only going to write about it positively. No, Your no. Your commitment will be shown in a different way. No, no. I think. I mean, I think it's just like bringing into about bringing into the conversation that you know, like what you are calling to task or like holding up as representative of the community has to be invested in like what that an acknowledgement of what that community values and like. Um, that positive and negativity has to include like presenting what that community um, revolves around and what it's what it values and I think you know that happens much more at an independent level than you know perhaps you know at a like major media media outlets so hang on, I'm, I'm confused though because you started by saying you wanted to call me to task oh just about that that last the about last thing you say. But I, I feel like what I was doing was trying to encourage people to start more. Yeah, but I, I think that was, I think you're, you're, you're speaking to, you know, the converted here. Like, you know, like how many people in this room, like, have started their own initiatives? Do you all pay your writers? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. I, so, yeah, I, I mean, that I just, it's something that I believe strongly with. I guess I don't get the task I'm being called to. Like, I'm, well, I, I'm not that we should get yeah, into this quagmire. No, I totally I'm, I'm sorry. But to, to <laughs> yeah. speak to your other point, uh, yes, I think that, of course, something that you have done and you have built and it's independent and it's location based, which I think is one, like, I love that. Uh, there's, uh, new, I mean, I'm in Brooklyn. There's like numerous local blogs that I love to read, some independently owned. I think most independently owned, probably, and like of course, it's reflexive. It's, it reflects the community, um, and I think that's that, that's a wonderful thing. That's uh, something that's very much come from the internet. Instead of having this massive coverage of trying to speak to as many people as possible because you're trying to get your circulation up, you can actually have a place that, like you're talking about, uh, exclusivity, like that's very very small. That that's power is drawn from the fact that it talks about the area, like either whether it's a small online culture or an actual physical area. Um, and I, I think that that's something that should definitely be applauded. I think the internet would have been a great place for that. I didn't use the word exclusive, did I? No, like what small scale operation. Selectivity. 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 There, there we go. Was. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, but it actually isn't. That's one of the biggest problems with the internet is that like it creates this platform, these possibilities, and then the 10 most visited websites, the only one of them that isn't controlled by a Forbes 500 company is Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. Just saying, just like to right, throw Right, but there's that so many there. other places. I mean, that's, so that's the top 10. Yeah. I mean, the top 10 TV companies, the top 10, I mean, yes, you go yeah. to the top 10, it's gonna be conglomerate, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't mean that we should be disheartened by it, the fact that there that are all these other places need to, to go find to. new ways of doing these things, though, because this economy of scale is really depressing. Mm. Um, should we move to you? Yeah. Yes, uh, I w getting maybe more to the nuance of the relationship of the critic to the community. Mm -hmm. um, I just I had left graduate school. I had a master's degree in, in painting and um, was given a grant in the late 1970s from the Center for Arts Criticism, which is based here in St. Paul, uh, to write art criticism. And every, I was cool, you know, I was like living in the loft and everybody I knew was artists and everybody loved me and I loved them. And then all of a sudden I got a grant to be an art critic and everybody hated me. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I think, I mean, I would go to the bar and people say, who do you think you are, Clement Greenberg and, or, you know, Barnett Newman and all this sort of stuff. And suddenly it became antagonistic. <laughs> And I, I felt like Sam Kinison, like, I'm just a kid, you know, leave me alone, I'm 20 years old. Like, what am I gonna do? I'm not, I don't have the power to like do anything with that. I just write. Um, but I think th historically there's a sort of antagonism between the critic and the community sometimes and the artists. And I see this in institutions locally where people, you know, who put on plays or whatever, they don't wanna, 
you know, talk to the critic or the critic is, is antagonistic or they want to like correct them or whatever. And I just wonder if, if you feel there is historical antipathy uh, and if there's a, if that has a function um, in terms of collusion and credibility and all that sort of stuff, that that antipathy, you're not just building people up. I mean, you're, you're writing, I like, I like the definition, you're just writing your own thoughts and you're using writing to discover that. <clears throat> and if that antipathy is historical, how has the internet changed that in the comments section, in the way you conceive of your audience? Um, I think, um, <laughs> yeah, you know, I think that um, uh, there is there is oftentimes um, a uh, a sense that journalists are writing negative reviews out of a place of insecurity or just a vindictiveness or 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 various other reasons. And artists make this claim. Sometimes fans who hold um, music really closely as as part of their identity when something that they love gets, you know, kind of torn down or, or not just not fully supported in the way that they think it should be. You know, they always make these kind of these types of claims. And um, and I think that really we're, you know, you 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 write negative reviews because you really because you care. You care about what your sub your, your subject. I mean, we care about music really a lot, and we really um, and it's really really deep for all of us. But I think that like. That it's it's just an absolutely necessary thing, and I think that in a lot of cases, it's you're speaking what's on a lot of people's minds. In some cases, you're just making the, the claim, um, or you're you're you have a completely independent point point of view that you're willing to put yourself out there on the line and 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 risk that kind of um, backlash. But um, yeah, I think that kind of it's it's um, it's it's always interesting. I think that it's just the the kind of go to um, response for people who. Um, you know, who disagree with, with criticism. And I think there was that, that, there was that great um, piece on, on Gawker of like uh, know, almost a year ago on Smarm, right? And that piece that talked about the differences, you know, between snark and Smarm. And that, that kind of, oh, you're just insecure. You're like vindictive or you're evil, you're nasty. Criticism comes from a nasty place in, in people and it shouldn't, you know, it's is, is this, uh, is this defensiveness is, and that what categorized as Smarm, you know? Um, I think that's, um, you know, people just don't really have a, a real reason for it. It's like, wow, you know, um, it's really, it's really mysterious why you would ha put, have to put, you put this out there. But it's, it's, it's really a, it's an essential part of the conversation. Christopher, yeah. oh, if, sorry, <laughs> sorry. If you're in criticism to make friends, you're in the wrong business. <laughs> for real. Um, the, the fundamental thing that a writer has to do in addressing a work of art is take it seriously. Um, you know, the, the, there's, there's got to be a level of, of respect involved. And short term, people might be upset. Long term, I think people understand that. Um, what about the comments section? That is something that I consider really important and I'm always really disappointed by. Yeah, I, <laughs> <laughs> my, my solution for that is I don't read them. I want to jump in here because that actually, <laughs> uh, that one used to be my, I, I, I think I thought about getting it tattooed on my chest. <laughs> Never read the comments. Yeah. Um, and that's, and for a long time that was a driving philosophy for mm -hmm. me. But uh, this, I think this ties in a couple of things uh, to your question that I kind of want to talk about. Uh, one, uh, I agree, I was going to say the same thing, like not here to make friends I think is very important. And I think, again, uh, my view of this is that it's all of larger conversation. Um, I think trying to break it down well, is negative or positive right or wrong? Like, of course, it's both right. Like that, I just can't believe that that's a question. Like, it is all important and is all part of the uh, part of the conversation. Two, I always want to talk about. I love that this conversation comes up around the internet because what people I feel like, especially recently, tend to forget is that the internet was a very negative place, like super <laughs> negative, and still is. And I especially feel like uh, uh, you only have to take a look uh, if you're a guy, maybe not so much, but take, just get a friend who's opinionated and she talks on Twitter and look at her mentions uh, just to realize that the internet is still a very, 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 can be a very harsh and terrible place. Um, so that, that there is a lot of negativity. Negativity is not going extinct. Negativity is going to, like, it's going to be fine and it's, and, and it's because it's important for some of it and some of it is people 
fucking harassing your friends, which is horrifying and tough. That said, uh, I'm glad I didn't get Never Read the Comments tattooed on my chest because I have kind of switched roles and I like actually love defending the comments now. That's a really important role of an editor too. I really, yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. If somebody comes into a comment section and just like spews racist shit, then yes, of course, delete it, fuck them. But uh, sometimes the comments is where these things that we're all talking about actually bump into each other. People have super, super, super smart and on the other side of the fence uh, uh, feelings about something. And in the comment section is when some, uh, some of that can come out. Now, is it all gold? Absolutely not. But that's where I'd like to point that the comment section is very much like the internet as a whole. It's looking for those really important conversations, whether negative, whether positive, you can find them and they're there and they're gold. And yes, sometimes they're surrounded by garbage. Uh, sometimes they're surrounded by even lovelier uh, conversations or more negative conversations, but that are still important. Um, but it all happens there because that's what this is all is, right? It's just humans kind of bumping into each other, uh, all given a voice, all given a space. So I actually, um, I, I, I am here for, don't get me wrong, not unregulated. I'm not, uh, although maybe there's a space for that as well, but I think in, in general, uh, the comments, actually some smart conversations can come out of it, sometimes. Yeah. And I think that is one of the roles of an editor is to lead those, like my editor at Rhizome responds to every comment on the site, which is kind of easy because you don't get that many comments on Rhizome, but there's also a really smart thing there where you're keeping your readers discussing what you're writing on the site and not on Facebook. Mm -hmm. It means that Mark Zuckerberg is not making money off of your intellectual property in the conversation about what you write. Which also leads me to another question from the internet. Um, this one is from Katie Southarp, who's asking if what we share affects what's get, what gets made. Mm. Um, and that seems like mm. maybe the two of you will have a lot of opinions about that. <laughs> I do? No, oh, the no, two of them. <laughs> <laughs> I have no Those opinion. of you who run online publications. I th I'm going to jump in and just say, I, to an extent, of course. But I also believe what Christopher says just about writing in general, um, whether it be criticism or whether it be art creation, right? People are going to make art. People are going to tell stories. F from the literary world, this is like one of the things that the human race has not dropped the ball on basically since the beginning. So like, it's always gonna happen. Now, will what gets talked about influence things? Of course, like the memoir blew up, uh, had a second, not, not blew up for the first time, but had like this other resurgence again in like the late 90s and you saw a lot of memoirs. But I also feel like art, like anything else, is a little self-correcting. Um, and, I, and I really believe that people are going to express themselves how they want to express themselves. So does it influence it? Of course, a little bit. But I still think if somebody feels very passionately about something, they're going to make it in spite of. Regardless of you. Regardless of any of us. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, I think that's true. And I, I, um, I guess I feel like it, um, I don't know, that it doesn't, it's not necessarily, well, it's better, isn't it kind of better to... Um, to kind of take a backseat to that role. I don't, in a sense, you're, you're um, paying attention and seeing what gets made and how people make it. I guess I feel like um, it does, it's not necessarily there. Criticism is not necessarily there to affect or influence. It's not really its role. It's not really our job. You know, it's, uh, it's uh, sort of, if it happens, it's kind of a byproduct. Um, ideally, in negative uh, reviews, um, th as long as it's not, you know, if, if it's something that's not completely harsh, completely, totally negative. Um, th ideally, there is a form of constructive criticism there that, that, uh, that, uh, that an artist can kind of take to heart. Um, but yeah, I think it's not, it's really not our, it's not our place. It's something that I think can affect it. And, and ideally, it can affect it positively because we do care. This is why we're saying this in the first place is because we have strong opinions about it. But at the same time, it's kind of let nature take its course. Should we take one more? There is... Where's the mic? Hi. There we go. It's always somewhere. Um, I'm Sky Gooden. I founded a, a site promoting art criticism last October. Um, I'm paying my writers and I'm paying myself a decent wage as well. It's obviously an urgent issue to our field and I feel that. I had a question from an advertiser of mine this morning um, wanting to jump in and saying though that he was worried online advertising was a bit moot because of the ad blocks that a lot of us employ on on our computers. So my question is to Orit. Uh, you mentioned in your, your short lecture there that you thought we should return to paywalls or a similar structure. I thought that didn't work out 
I'm pretty sure it didn't work out. So I just wondered if you could speak to that a bit at a bit more length and, and talk about why you think it still has a possibility uh, as, a, as a model for us. Um, that's a really good question. I think it will work out because I think that presumption that everything online will always be free makes no sense whatsoever. Um, advertising has never supported any industry that much. Journalism, that happened there, and we all knew that that was not a great idea, actually. I mean, the idea of like newspapers with like champagne in the rooms and like, that happened. That wasn't the like high time of journalism. I think that people really believe in what they read. They're interested in that. They will pay for that. It's a really, really difficult move to do. I'm not jealous of the first ones to do that. A lot of art magazines have introduced paywalls on their site. A lot of people are doing it really smartly, like Freeze that closes the current issue and then their entire archive is open. That seems like a really great way of dealing with the internet. But yeah, your readers should support what you do, point blank. They should also prefer that. They pref should prefer to pay whatever they pay so as not to get advertising that takes advantage of them. I think it also helps clarify, I mean, what, what, one of the things that, that I run into a lot is the assumption that social media is public space, and it's not. It's private space. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's corporately owned private space in, in which uh, labor is given for free, <laughs> basically. Um, <clears throat> and doing some version of a, a paywall thing helps to clarify the situation in which you're engaged. Another question from the audience? Uh, where's the microphone? Um, I guess there, right there. there. Yeah. Oh, OK. Go for it. Hi. <laughs> so um, a lot of the criticism that's been discussed is in terms of um, someone sort of on high discussing individual projects by a maker of some sort, whether it's art or a book or whatever. What do you think the value is of a critic in the sense of speaking to um, analyzing what cultural institutions or presenters are doing? Do you think the value of negative criticism changes within that context? And I don't know, I'm just interested in hearing you speak to that a little bit more in terms of the, the broad scope of criticism and who it can be directed towards. Anyone want to feel that first or should I? I'm really into it. So. Get in there, <laughs> go for it. Um, I actually think it's easier to criticize institutions than individuals. Um, that said, it's really terrifying because institutions are usually more powerful than the, free, than the freelance critic. I have had a long dream of doing a blog or something like that that criticizes art magazines. Cover to cover, read the whole thing, write your criticism, you'll be the best reader this magazine will ever have. I would never make a living if I did that. Every magazine would hate me. So I did that publicly with other people. And it's the most engaging conversation I've ever had. And I think museums should do that too. I think they should have like critical groups coming in to discuss like what they do as an institution. Because otherwise, all they get is the stage to basically like tap themselves on the back, be like, we're so great, we do research and like R and D in a museum. Oh my god, I shouldn't have said this. <laughs> in a museum. <laughs> Never <mind. laughs> Now keep going. Yeah. Yeah. You got it. Now it's already out. You gotta be brave about it now. <laughs> we got your back. <laughs> the walker comes for you. It's okay. So I saw a curator at a major museum speak at a panel. She was amazing. She was great. Um, but she also talked about the museum as an R and D lab. Um, and no one asked any questions about that. Any questions about how you translate financial models from Silicon Valley to cultural production. No one really thought about that as like something that needs to be like very critically discussed. And that was on stage in another museum. Um, I think those things should be easier, and I think there's a lot of room for them. Uh, yeah, I think it's important is really what, because that's how change happens, right? Calling out institutions, like that's, if we wanted things to stay the same, nobody, you know, like that, I think that's incredibly important and that is how you up places diversity. That's how you fight if, if you've got a local museum or a local, uh, or a publishing house that you love, you know, if there's somebody like, and you want to see change in those directions, of course you're gonna have to, to stand up and have those conversations and that's, um, imp like it's just important, right? Like I feel like that's, that is like, I feel like that's being a good citizen. Like that's not just being a critic, that's being like, I think that's uh, all of us as, as Americans or as human beings, that's, that's what we should be doing all the time. Because that's like, that, these are the things that we care about. Like, and and that's, that's what you wanna see reflected in the institutions around you. Yeah, 
but sometimes a lot of good can get, come from getting punched on the nose. I would not be here if I get punched <laughs> on the nose. But like, yeah, like I think, uh, and, and it can be super dangerous. And we're seeing like now, not to get too philosophical, we're, we're getting into a much broader <laughs> conversation. But uh, it's like, uh, I mean, we're seeing that with our actual government right now, right? And I think that's important uh, as citizens to do that. First Amendment and everything, as Americans. Spe especially with art institutions. Sorry. I mean, the, yeah, <coughs> you know, the, the, the whole, so socially, the whole big, big, socially and politically, the whole big trend um, since the 1980s has been to privatize. Privatize public space. Everything public has, be has been privatized and privatized and privatized. Well, institutions, whether it's, whether it's the Walker or the Metropolitan or the LA County Museum or, or whatever, are public institutions. They're, you know, I subsidize them with, you know, with my my taxes, as does everybody else. And the degree to which um, they're handed over um, to money can become a real problem. Um, there is a, uh, the commercialization of American museums that's going on now is uh, really disturbing to me. I'm, this is on the top of my mind because I'm in the midst of writing a, a, a sort of long um, uh, piece about this. Um, but it, it's it's getting to it's getting to a point where it's so pervasive. The commercialization of museums is so pervasive that people don't pay attention to it anymore. It's becoming the new norm. It's like, oh well, yeah, of course it's that way. Well, it doesn't have to be that way. Um, and I need to use my institutional clout, um, a, as I said in my talk. I need to use my power against their power. Um, in and. Let them do with it what they want. You know that's that's not up to me. It's just up to me to, um, yeah, as a journalist, to say this is what I see going on and this is why I think it's screwy. That's all. Mm -hmm. I think. Well, uh, okay. Um, any last words? <laughs> there we go. I feel like this is why it's screwy is a perfect place to end. <laughs> 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 okay. Good. Good.